Do you think the media sometimes overstates the sort of level of alarm people should have about terrorism? Absolutely. Oh, this is beyond anything that, that we've seen. We will follow them to the gates of hell. The United States is confronting emerging security challenges on a scale not seen since the rise of the Soviet Union. From the start, our goal has been first to contain, and we have contained them. I don't think the approach is sufficient to the job. We have um, all along underestimated ISIS. This is not a time to just kind of sit back and hope that somehow this enemy will go away. We exposed evidence of doctored intelligence in the war on terror months before the national media ran with it. We all want to know the answer. This is, this is serious. Now the White House will answer our questions. Our special guest is White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough. We'll work through the allegations at CINCOM here in Tampa, the refugee crisis in Syria, our options in the war on ISIS, and what the presidential candidates would change. We need a ground force. We should have a no-fly zone. I would bomb the shit out of them. We'll also show you how the media is inadvertently fueling Donald Trump. Plus, prosecutors are taking more action after our investigation exposed voter fraud across the state of Florida. This is Money, Power, and Politics. Hello, I'm Craig Patrick. Well, the president is sending more special operations forces into the ISIS war zone. We'll go to the White House in just a couple of minutes. But we'll start with a look at what we're already doing in Syria, what the presidential hopefuls say we should be doing, and why there are no easy answers. We should have a no-fly zone in Syria. That could stop ISIS if it had an air force. ISIL does not have planes. Which takes us back to hitting ISIS on the ground. I would bomb the shit out of them. In hindsight, we should have done more to knock out the terrorist black market oil machine, but the administration says it's doing it now. This air campaign will not destroy ISIL. We need a ground force in Iraq and Syria, and America has to be part of that ground force. That's exactly what ISIS wants. America versus the ISIS killers on their home turf in Sunni territory, where a lot of the people sympathize with ISIS. That could be a prescription for Vietnam all over again, or Iraq before Petraeus moved in. But today, even General Petraeus says U.S. ground troops are a bad idea. We should have a support for the remnants of the Syrian Free Army and create safe zones. Good luck defending safe zones in a war zone where a mass murdering dictator is duking it out with ISIS and Al Qaeda. As for supporting the Free Syrian Army, that may have worked four years ago, but now there's not much left, and most of the rebels today are linked with Al Qaeda. Don't give weapons to people who hate us. Don't give weapons who pe to people who want to kill us. So what does that leave? Local people and nations have to secure their own communities. Well, the problem is ISIS swept into Iraq with pickup trucks because those local people wanted ISIS there. ISIS needs to be defeated by a ground force that's made up primarily of Sunni Arabs because these are Sunni Arab territories that they've taken hold of. Yes, but again, Sunni Arabs let ISIS take over because they saw it as a better alternative to the Shia-led persecution that they had endured. If they drive out ISIS, they fear a return to that persecution or a mass murdering dictator who gassed his own people. It's going to take time. The president believes in his strategy, but polls show most Americans do not, in part because he's struggling to sell it. And even his key Democrats and former members of his inner circle don't buy it. I don't think the approach is sufficient to the job. This has gone on too long now, and uh, it has not gotten better. It's gotten worse. We have um, all along underestimated ISIS. This is not a time to just kind of sit back and hope that somehow this enemy will go away. Well, when the president said he won't put boots on the ground, he means we won't commit to large-scale ground combat. We already have boots on the ground for limited missions. And we're sending more special forces to lead raids and free hostages and improve intelligence. And that's where we may have a big problem, because as we revealed months ago, analysts at CINCOM say someone is manipulating intelligence. And former deputy director of Intel at CINCOM, Colonel James Warshuck, says he believes them. 
mind-boggling, to say the least. Now, as the Inspector General expands the investigation, and we've learned analysts who warned us about ISIS were told to cut it out, Warshuk says it suggests a breakdown in Washington. We all want to know the answer. This is, this is serious. This obviously was undue pressure and influence from someone in Washington uh, that caused people to do this. He says there has been pressure to inflate a danger to protect turf or expand military or intel budgets, but he never imagined senior officials would distort intelligence to paint a rosier picture, especially with an enemy like ISIS. To go the opposite direction, say you're, you're making them look bigger than they are and stronger than they are, tone it down. That's never been seen before. Nobody has ever done that before. Well, before we bring in Dennis McDonough, we also want to take a moment to look into the refugee program with Syria. Republican governors fear that a terrorist could trick us by posing as a refugee and then get into our country that way. Well, the president says the process here works and should not be changed. The House wants changes and the White House is at odds with Governor Scott and others. And again, this takes us to the screening process and a failure to communicate. It's frustrating that the, the president uh, is not willing to give us information. Uh, he's not been somebody that's been forthcoming uh, with information. On one hand, Governor Scott and other governors are bashing the White House for not giving them enough information. They don't tell us what, who's going to come into our state. They give us no information. We don't have enough information. But they could be complaining about not receiving information that they never even requested, at least at first. Watch how Governor Scott dodges when asked if he even asked for it. What specific information have you asked for that you haven't received? They don't provide any information. What uh, information specifically? So they don't provide any information on any of these, on any of these individuals coming. DCF has asked for that information and it hasn't been given, even though that they're... They never they're give us information on any of these. But then they specifically asked for it, your administration has. They've never given us any information. Anyone else? Have you asked for it? I'm saying they've never given us any information. That sounds like a no. Right. Any other questions? Else? Governor. Now the president and his team are firing off letters to Scott and others, explaining how the refugee program works and why they say it's thorough. Now people should remember that no refugee can enter our borders until they undergo the highest security checks of anyone traveling to the United States. Well, please welcome White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Craig. Well, FBI Director James Comey said that he cannot offer anybody an absolute assurance that there is no risk associated with accepting refugees from Syria because, among other reasons, there are gaps in the availability of the data. Is the FBI Director right or wrong about that? Well, I think uh, the FBI Director has said that uh, he stands by the system that we've put in place because it is robust. And that's why it's so important, Craig, that this uh, system that we have put in place, which we've you know, double-checked now after Paris, given uh, the nefariousness and the evil of those attacks, the system that we have relies not only on data databases, but there are seven databases everywhere from the FBI to DHS to DOD to all the intelligence community. We require uh, refugees to sit down to be interviewed by experts from the United States government. Those experts are expert in document deception, in interview deception. This is a very comprehensive system that relies on databases, seven of them, uh, as well as on individual interviews. We feel good about the program that we have in place, but we are constantly assessing it, constantly making sure that it's kept up to speed, and we're obviously going to work very closely with every one of our members uh, in the government to ensure that it keeps the American pe people safe. Then why not ask the heads of the FBI and Homeland Security and the Director of National Intelligence to certify that the refugees we accept are not threats to national or homeland security? Well, in fact, uh, they do, in fact, certify that the program itself lives up to exactly that. The, the question really in the House bill comes down to one that uh, makes it unworkable because these uh, heads of these agencies have a whole host of threats that we have to guard against. So we'll continue to work with Congress on this. Uh, we think that the House bill uh, would have uh, taken important resources off of other threats. We think that's a mistake. We have to see the full range of threats that this country is uh, up against. That's why the system that we have in place, which we've double checked, is a good one and we'll me make sure that we can keep the country safe while living up to our values. When did you first learn that intelligence analysts at CENTCOM claim that their reports were being whitewashed and doctored, and how did you respond? What I know is what the president has told me, Craig, which is what he demands in intelligence is the truth, 
That's what he expects from the intelligence agencies, and that's what we'll continue to demand from our intelligence agencies. The overwhelming majority of that work from these experts uh, and from these selfless patriots in the intelligence community is exactly that, telling hard truths to power, telling hard truths to the president. That's the way he wants it. If, the ins if this instance is one where it was not the case, then we'll get to the bottom of that, and I think that's the process we're under. But I want to be extraordinarily clear. What the president expects from the intelligence community is the truth, even if those are hard truths, because he's got a hard job working on behalf of Floridians, people in Tampa Bay, but across the country to make sure that we keep this country safe. That's what he'll demand. Mr. McDonough, thank you for your time. Thanks, Greg. Coming up, we found people in Florida voting, then voting again in the same election. And prosecutors are taking action after our investigation. Finally, it begins. We'll also bring you a list of people who are helping Donald Trump by mistake. And David Martin will join us for the News Remixed. now, three people you'd least expect to carry water for Donald Trump are inadvertently fueling his campaign. We'll start the helping Trump countdown at number three, Jeb Bush. Grr, just angry all the time. Well, Bush brushed off Trump as an angry old man because he had no idea how angry the base of his party was with establishment Republicans like him. So by running as a pseudo candidate to raise big money for months, Jeb embodied the establishment. Then he let Trump kick him around like a soccer ball while Jeb could not get out of his own way. Knowing what we know now, would you have authorized the invasion? I would have. And now by hanging into the race, Jeb Bush is holding on to money and support that would otherwise go to someone like Marco Rubio, who could give Trump more of a run for his money if Jeb wasn't there. Let's say he's president. Oh, yeah, yeah. That brings us to number two on the helping Trump countdown, President Obama. We don't have a strategy yet. First, he struggled to get a strategy on ISIS, then struggled to explain it, then came across as aloof and petulant after a massacre in Paris. Why can't we take out these bastards? Well, Jim, I just, I just spent uh, the last three questions answering that very question. By his own admission, Obama is not good at optics. It's not something that, uh, um, that always comes naturally to me. Uh, but it matters. And that creates a hunger among Republicans for someone who projects strength and comes across as more animated. And Trump is certainly that. Hey, look at this! Donald Trump! Donald Trump! But he's so animated that his critics may see faces in the clouds and accuse him of stuff they can't prove. Which brings us to number one on the helping Trump list, the media. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. Check out that definitive headline on CNN. Trump mocks reporter with disability. The New York Times and others convicted him, though Trump insists he did not know the reporter he was quoting was disabled. So while it may look as if Trump may have mocked a disabled man on national TV, Trump is so animated you can run the risk of jumping to conclusions, maybe thinking he also mocked ping pong players. Bing, bing, bing. Or made fun of people with vertigo. Uh, uh. or made fun of someone choking on dinner uh, uh. or pretending to fire shots into the side balcony ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. or mocking the three stooges. Uh, uh, uh. And when the media jumps to conclusions that cannot be proven and Trump denies it, it just keeps feeding him. The press is very, very dishonest and I think people are wise to the press. That's a typical case of the press with misinterpretation. They take a half a cent. They're scum. So bad, so illegitimate. They are just terrible people. Pretty good percentage is really a terrible group of people. Now, if you like the media, give them a big hand. And if you don't, give them a big boo. I had a feeling. All right, you've heard Trump's rivals and critics write him off for months, saying this or that will surely take him down. But watch what happened after he was accused of mocking a disabled man and lying about thousands of Muslims in New Jersey celebrating the September 11th attacks. The real clear politics average of national polls shows he surged. He's riding higher now than ever, passing his previous high water mark from September. He's up around a dozen points in the average of polls. He's up 20 points, by the way, in the poll commissioned by CNN. And Jeb Bush in that same poll slipped to 3%. And Bush's campaign allies have spent around 30 
million dollars in ads. So bottom line, Trump is way up in the Republican race. Hillary Clinton is way up in the Democratic race. That means tonight they are the focus of news remixed and some punchlines at their expense. David Martin, take it away. Welcome to the News Remix. I'm David Martin. That's Art Miles. And these funny people are giving us the punchline. So let's play. Hold it. Cue professional voiceover. The views expressed on the News Remix are those of the people featured and are not necessarily those of this station or its employees. All right, let's have some fun now with fun facts about presidential candidates. This time around, it's Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Did you know that Hillary Clinton served on the boards of Walmart and TCBY? I don't think Hillary took her time on the TCBY board seriously. She soft served. Oh, cute. A dad joke. Cue rim shot. Time Magazine reported that when Donald Trump was in college, he enjoyed reading federal foreclosure listings just for fun. And he probably read birth announcements trying to find his future ex-wives. According to the Washington Post, Hillary tried to join the Marines before marrying Bill, but was rejected for being too old. Hillary didn't get into the Marines, but she does have a pantsuit with a full metal jacket. On Late Night with Conan O'Brien, Trump said he's never used an ATM. You don't need to use an ATM when you hide your nest egg in your hair. Donald Trump has never used an ATM. And honestly, he doesn't really need to. He always has Tiny Tim's wallet on him. Donald Trump has never used an ATM that makes him very relatable to a lot of us who don't have enough money in the bank to use an ATM. The Donald never used an ATM because he couldn't make Trump his PIN number. Well, my name is my PIN number. There's only three letters in art. The first A is silent. Come say hi to us on Facebook.com slash The News Remixed and give our comedians the love they deserve. And speaking of love, in the book Hillary's Choice by Gail Sheehy, there's a story about when Hillary was a child. She wrote to NASA asking about how to become an astronaut. And NASA replied, girls can't be astronauts. Well, that's too bad because a lot of people would like to see her strapped to a rocket and shot into space. All right, as you seriously consider who you'll pick for president, a man from Florida says he voted once, then twice, then three times in the same election. Finally, we get our first prosecution. We'll show you how some voters have been getting away with fraud. And now sources tell us we'll have prosecutions in waves. See how our investigation drove action in Florida and North Carolina. When state lawmakers passed new voter laws and when Governor Scott ordered a voter purge, they said they were trying to snuff out fraud. We also don't want people that don't have a right to vote to be voting. But my colleague Mike Sinan and I worked on an investigation that revealed a problem those efforts would likely have missed. People voting in multiple states in the same election. And I support my people in North Carolina, support my people here. That's Mike asking a voter in the Orlando area why records from 2012, the last presidential year, show he voted in Florida and North Carolina. Because I live both in places. Uh -huh. In North Carolina, I pay taxes in North Carolina, I do the same thing here. He said he didn't know you're not supposed to do that. Well, I didn't know that. As Mike knocked on doors in Orlando, I found six others in Hillsborough, seven in Pinellas County, who, according to public records, voted in Florida and North Carolina in 2012. And with public records provided by the Voter Integrity Project, our list grew to 149 people who appeared to have voted in Florida and North Carolina in the same election. We were able to find 149 that we could stake our reputation on turn them over to the authorities and say, you might want to investigate this. We did that last November. The state's Division of Elections told us they had launched a preliminary investigation and left it at that. But a year after our initial investigation, authorities in North Carolina did take action. Finally, we get our first prosecution. The district attorney in Rutherford County, North Carolina, sent me these records showing he had successfully prosecuted Pasco Parker from Pasco County. Records show he admitted to voting in 2012, not just in two states, but in three, Florida and North Carolina and Tennessee. He got a suspended sentence, probation, and a fine, and his case may be just the start. There'll be another one, another Florida, North Carolina one, 
and there are several more uh, that we know that are in the pipeline between Florida and North Carolina. This is the first one, and finally, it begins. Well, the Department of State says it takes this very seriously, but Florida cannot fully participate in multi-state cross-checks because of differences in public records laws. Make sure you do vote on March the 1st. That's Hillary Clinton telling Florida Democrats to vote on the wrong day. But another candidate told us something about Florida he may regret much more. All right, now here's George Pataki with an interview he'd like us to forget. If you're still in this race come March 15th, how would you go about campaigning in Florida? What would your strategy be? How would you connect voters? Uh, the way I've always done it, which is to, to just reach out to people. I love retail campaigning. I love meeting people head to head. Yeah, after telling us how hard he'll work in Florida, George Pataki missed the filing deadline and forgot to get his own name on the Florida ballot. By the way, we have more interviews and investigations on Facebook. Uh, like us, Fox 13's Craig Patrick on Facebook. We'll join you once again next Sunday night at 11.30 p.m. Thank you so much for watching.